Well, I hope you had a great weekend, wonderful time worshiping Jesus Sunday, and you've already read Isaiah chapter 1, which is the chapter we're looking at today in our Bible reading plan and in this devotion. And you'll recall last week, um, we read in the book of Kings and Chronicles about King Uzziah, and then Friday, we looked at Isaiah chapter 6, and Isaiah being in the temple receiving this vision from God and a call from God to be a prophet in the year that King Uzziah died. Well, today we're in Isaiah chapter 1, and that should say something to you, that his call to be a prophet is in chapter 6, but chapter 1 is actually one of his prophecies. And here's the thing to keep in mind when you read Isaiah, Jeremiah, etc. You're not reading um, history. I mean, it's historically true, but what I'm saying is, don't read these books chronologically. In other words, don't think, well, chapter 1 happens first, and then Isaiah 2 is next, and Isaiah 3 is next. That's not how these prophetic books in the Old Testament work. What you have is a collection, a collection of sermons, a collection of visions, a collection of uh, experiences that are recorded in the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah. And some of them do follow one and the other, but most of it is not. And, and uh, when we try to date it, it's really a challenge because you have to look at what's he talking about and is there anything in the message that relates to an historical event. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to date when he preached these various sermons or received these visions. So just remember, when you're reading Isaiah, don't think of it. Well, chapter 7 historically follows chapter 6. Chronologically, chapter 10 follows chapter 9. No, it's just like a collection of his sermons, a collection of his visions put together in one book. So if you keep that in mind, uh, you'll, 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 do, you'll do better in reading Isaiah. Now, in chapter 1, what we have is one of his visions, one of his sermons. And, uh, uh, and I, I think this is later in his ministry, actually, because of the, the content. And what I wrote at the top of my journal after reading uh, this chapter is they were very religious, but God rejected them anyway. I mean, they were very, very religious as a people. But God rejected them. Um, notice what Isaiah says about them here in verses 2 and 3. He said, Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up. My children, my family, a way referring to the Jewish people. But they have revolted against me. And then he says, An ox knows its owner. A donkey its master's manger is feeding trough. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. So he's saying, the truth is, you really don't know me. This very religious people, you really, you don't know me. You're religious, but you don't know me. Look at verses 11 and following. He said, this is, and, and through the prophet Isaiah, God is speaking to the people of Israel. And he says, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me? God said, you offer all these burnt offerings, all these sacrifices. What does that mean to me? Says the Lord, I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. And then God says, I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. Now they were following the, the law of the Old Testament in these sacrifices, but God says, doesn't mean anything to me. Verse 12. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? It's, it's, God, it's, it's like God is saying, when you show up here to worship, you're like a mob. You, that's how I view you. You're, you're doing all this religious stuff, but it's just like you're a mob. Wow. Verse 13. Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assembly, these special worship gatherings. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. And then in verse 14, strong language. God says, I hate 
your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts, they have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. Can, can you imagine God saying to me and you, I'm sick of you coming to church and doing all the stuff you do at church? That's in essence what he's saying. Verse, uh, verse 15. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Mm. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Why? Because your hands are covered with blood. And so God says, this very religious people, the truth is, with all this religious activity, this religious stuff you do, you don't know me. And I am sick of all your religious activity. Why? Because your hands are covered with blood. What does that mean? Why did God say their hands were covered with blood? Well, let's look at a few more verses. Verse 16. He says, wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Now listen. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. And plead for the widow. Drop down to verse 23. Your rulers are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and chases after rewards. What can I get out of it? How does this benefit me? Corruption. They do not defend the orphan, nor does the widow's plea come before them. Wow. Just wow. Amos, who we'll read in a few days, Preached. He was a prophet just a few years before Isaiah and said some very, very similar things. What Isaiah is saying, this prosperous, corrupt nation filled with people who go to church and are very religious and do all the festivals and they pray and they bring their offerings and their sacrifices, yet they... they don't treat the least of these the right way. Those who are vulnerable in a society. He mentioned specifically the orphans and the widows, the poor and the powerless. They matter. And here's the thing. He's writing this to the nation and to its leaders and to its people, meaning that the policies of a government... According to the word of God, Isaiah, Amos, other places in the scripture, the policies of a nation toward its weakest, most vulnerable systems, citizens rather, uh, matters to God. And when we allow the rich and the powerful to become too rich and too powerful and don't think about the impact that we as a society sometimes have on the weakest and the most vulnerable. God says he notices. And being religious without supporting policies that really are effective at helping the weak and the poor and the powerless is an abomination before God. You know, as Bible-believing saints, we care about the vulnerable. We care about the unborn, abortion. We care about ethics and morality. So the issues with, uh, you know, sexual values and LBGTQ and all of that matter to us. But I want to say to those of us who are Bible-believing disciples of Jesus, we should care just as much about how our government treats the poor and the vulnerable as we do these other issues. Because God, in his word, judged an entire nation because they didn't care enough. So let's be careful. Let's be biblical. Because we don't want God to say to us, I am sick of your religious activity when you support policies that take advantage of people. Just 
just a word to the wise from the Word of God. I'll see you tomorrow.